This is the Stop Time Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hopkins, and I'm here to engage you in thought-provoking motivational conversations around practicing the art of living in the moment. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm excited to dig deep and offer insights into embracing who we are and where we are at. <laughs> we could easily spend several podcasts speaking about the astonishing accomplishments that each of you have made both separately and together in music, theater, film, and beyond. And I encourage my listeners to check out the links in the show notes to experience the true magical talents of my guests. The reason I invited them here today is that I am truly fascinated to learn more about your unique approach to life and the world that we are living in. Welcome to the Brothers Page, Josh and Zach. I'm so excited to have you. <laughs> so excited to be Thank here. Thank you for having us. It's, a, yeah. it's an honor after all these years. We've known each other for so long. And I'm excited to, to talk with you because whenever you talk to somebody that knew you when you were younger, they, they bring up things that you can't even remember about yourself. And I think that that's a special part of our relationship. So, yeah. yeah. No, no, absolutely. Oh my God, I have so much to ask you guys, but I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm totally being influenced by you right now. Oh my God, wait, yeah. that's that, really fascinating. That's yeah, ironically yeah. why <laughs> in like a party, Zach prefers to kind of score and see how if he's playing in a certain way, it will affect how people are talking in certain ways. And for me, it's so comforting because I almost feel like I'm expressing what I'm feeling without talking. Because talking makes me a little more nervous than guitar, but for me to be able to like comment emotionally without interrupting anything is really a blessing to me. So, so if I said to Zach, you know, um, so you're telling me, you know, where, where are each of you guys living and spending most of your time these days? What would you say musically? Honestly, the musical is almost like, like the energy of the way I'm choosing to approach the question almost like, um, so it's almost like, Yeah, I, li I like approaching things with like a disposition like towards warmth and hopeful. I've learned that like my energy just really loves tuning things to like that. So I'll almost use the guitar to almost like dose in some warmth and hope to my mind as I think of the answer to that question. Mm. Yep. But in terms of just, I, I love just a score to like a kind of neutral but leaning towards warmth and hopeful score. So yeah, I'm living in a concrete jungle in a little box next to millions of other isolated humans, but so close to one another. And it's, it's really fascinating. I love creating and living in New York City. Mm -hmm. and it's a crazy time to be here, for sure. Yeah, so you like to lead with positivity, with what we call anabolic energy. And, and kind of find like an optimistic warmth that's honest and not disconnected from reality. And it's, it's like, like I have my chords where it's like, we have to face the shadows. We can't just live in a happy little bubble all the time, but when we have that happiness and we move to the shadows, the shadow yearns for the light and the light yearns for the shadow. And there's just like, music really helps me feel the importance of, of my opposite. Cause whenever I play too happy for too long, I feel this just yearning for some, some darker, deeper, more honest chords that respect that side of reality, which is so prevalent in the world right now. Yeah. I've found a little far out, but. Not, not at all, it makes perfect <clears throat> sense to me actually. In everything, um, you know, we need we need juxtaposition, right? You need dark mm. to have light, you have light to have dark. It's almost like if you choose to swing the pendulum yourself, it doesn't force you to swing. Mm. I've found that to be kind of like an energetic law of the universe, almost like it has to swing. So it's really wise to learn to, to swing it yourself opposed to whip, push, say, I only want warmth, I only want hope. And then the universe forces you to the other side. If you go there, it says, all right, I don't need to force you. You're, you're, you're going between them yourself. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've found that, yeah. <laughs> so guys, what would you say is the, is the greatest challenge you've faced so far in these uncertain times? Uh, I think it's, it's that at any given time, all artists in the world were at a certain level of development when this wave hit. You might have been five years deep into working on a specific project. You might have, uh, you know, 
in our in our case, we were so we were about to get on a bus and go travel throughout the United States, which was a huge dream of ours because we had spent so much time online that we were really hungering for um, for for connecting with people in person. Um, so for us, I think it's just the level of intensity that the rug got swept out from under everybody at the same time has been a little bit difficult to come to terms with, but then also inspiring in, in so many different ways, because, you know, if you're a genuinely creative person, it's hard to not be equally as excited by, by a blank page. Um, but that doesn't mean that there weren't things that had momentum and a lot of years of energy um, that were very suddenly canceled and, and turned into question marks. So that's, uh, that can be rough because a lot of, a lot of the artistic life is sacrificing um, some of the normal comforts so that you can build towards making some dreams come true. 100%. So Josh, what I'm hearing is that, and what I'm really curious about, a few things stand out. One is, one is that you, you really think about everybody. I was asking how you guys were doing. Mm -hmm. And you talked about your tour, you know, while we were about to do, you know, the most important thing, the biggest tour of our life, you said that, but then you very quickly, everything was, was we, and you didn't mean the two of you, you meant all of us, all of the yeah. arts community, all of the, and that, so I just want to point that out and celebrate yeah. that, because that's, that's sure. incredible. It is really cool. Yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of my role, uh, you know, in Brothers Page and, and, and in our brotherhood in general, because in the end, our music is more just a metaphor for how we balance each other out and different archetypes of what we focus on. And a lot of my focus is on the collective network of humanity and where our attention is focused. And in focusing on that almost to an extreme, I'm able to take some of the, the mystical um, musical channeling that, you know, comes through Zach, through the universe, and help turn it into something that I can get in front of people. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'm genuinely in my heart as concerned for the collective right now, um, and maybe even a, less, a little bit less concerned for us, because I think for the past decade of our entire lives, we've been doing the opposite of what the norm is. So, you know, nobody was more prepared for everything to shut down than us because we didn't build the foundation of our creativity on anything that was dependent on the, um, the industry. Even, yeah, even in terms of like, uh, we've developed a system of producing and recording that is just us in a really comforting like home-like way and the way formal professional studios are really intense and make you nervous and not every kind of performer strives under that kind of pressure and that thankfully wasn't taken away from us in this quarantine yeah and our heart goes out to artists who did have their stages and their studios and the places they worked taken away from them that's like really tragic and needs to kind of be addressed and fixed depending on how long this is going to last yeah. yeah 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 this this bigger connection with each other and with how you want to work when when did that start evolving i mean like our our parents raised us with like a very specific mentality or or a style of parenting that is it's so against playing favorites that if one person does something wrong then both are punished equally so there's this fusion that happened when we were growing up where it was us against the world a little bit um or us you know going through that low together and fighting our way back to to a good place so i think that it was kind of infused in our parenting that we um were treated not not like a unit to the disservice of our individuality but like a unit uh, to the service of what brotherhood should be. It, it's just become innate that people have turned brotherhood into rivalry. And I just don't think that that's what the world is hungry for at all. I think the world is really starving for harmony. And that really starts with who you uh, choose to create with. Obviously, there's some innate rivalry in reality with, between any two people, but they did everything possible to avoid creating conditions where we would be put at odds with each other. And I think that's the core of our relationship that later just started to unfold naturally through both of us singing, me playing guitar. But Josh has always very deeply supported 
and helped me break out of any boxes I was put in by my developmental stages of growth, which those boxes are amazing. But whenever I see like a, a guitarist who's just trapped in the guitar box for life, it makes me kind of sad. So it's really amazing that Josh helped me move from being a guitarist into a producer, into a songwriter, all these things. Cause, cause I just see so, I remember all my friends were like, Zach, you're a guitarist. Like you're not a, you're not a singer. And it's like, and Josh was always the exact opposite. So mm. I think that's the, like kind of the profound foundation from my end of how Josh influence me and us and yeah and I mean it's always going to be the people that are closest to you that know what you have that you're not sharing or that you're not able to articulate yet um and I feel like uh you know again if we had been rival brothers then it, it wouldn't it, be it infuses interest, that yeah. energy where like, one of them wants to sit back and, and and enjoys the failures and the struggling um and then you're not able to create the kind of unit of energy where you can each each be you know, the strengths to each other's weaknesses. I'm a very like pure loving person. And even I, when I see people in competitive fields, a part of me wants them to fail. And that's just like a, I think a cultural poison that luckily didn't make it into our family, I guess. Yeah, well, there's this feeling like, oh, well, if that, you know, if there's, there's only 1% so yeah. of people can succeed, then you're constantly watching with this anxiety, like, oh, am I not going to be in that, in that class or this or that? And then you're just already disconnected from whatever you would want to communicate to the world. In a typical nuclear family, the tendency would be, you know, well, you know, so-and-so is gonna get the piano lessons and so-and-so is gonna get the dance lessons because we're not made of money. So I'm curious to know, first of all, how, how it was identified, um, which, which direction you would at least start going in by your parents? Because I mean, that, you know, you're young, right? So. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, there's always that time when you're young where, you know, everybody's kind of like getting guitar lessons. And then I think, I think from a, from a parent perspective, um, there's less effort and there's less decision on their part, but they're at least planting seeds of potential. Yeah. You know? And they're taking note of like what, you know, what tree is growing like wildfire where this one can't even like sprout a bud. You know, there were there were maybe two weeks of my life where I was a much better guitar player than Zach. And after those two weeks, it was just all over. He, he was so aggressively, lovingly mastering uh, this form of communication that it it just became another limb on his arm. And then with me, for the voice for me, it came at a time where I, I really didn't feel like I fit in with anybody uh, in elementary school at the time. It was more of a sports focused um, school. So that's really what everybody was into. And then there were just a few experiences in shows where I got to feel like, oh, maybe this is this this isn't something that I'm good at. Maybe this is the only thing that I'm good at. So I kind of had that in my mind for a while that the only thing that really set me apart was this feeling that like I might have great high notes one day. And it sounds like as stupid as that, but I can, I can remember kind of feeling that when I was before voice change even, that I wanted to be able to express that energy and voice it in front of people. And, and also with me, there was a stigma when I was young where it was what I was most afraid of was being on stage. And I think it just kind of buried in my head and became a little bit of an, of an obsession that the universe would be like, here's the only thing that you might be good at and let's make you really afraid of it at the same time. Mm. And it's like, oh, oh, okay. Um, now to get there, I'm gonna really have to conquer something that is very challenging, especially when you're not already, you know, a top of the pyramid kind of popular kid at like a jock school, you know? So that kind of counterculture, uh, aggressive ego war inside of me just kind of kept driving me towards um, finally being able to stand on a stage like that and, and take a deep breath and, and share my voice, I think. Um, I don't want people to think the first instrument you try, if you don't click with it, that it's over. Cause I had to try like five or six and um, you too for a while. Yeah. Finding the singing identity, you have to just do this taste test thing and you have to be supportive or yeah, having, having parents that are supportive. There's energy inside both of us that was trying to get through. And if we didn't, try a bunch of things we might not have found what it was yeah what about virtuosity there's one thing to have a gift and then there's one thing to develop the gift mm. i'm hearing absolutely 100 percent that the gift is just coming through you as you said it's, it's part of who you are 
at what point did you know that? At what point did it become part of you? Or was it there from the beginning and that, that sort of motivated you to, to work hard? There's definitely an initial spark for both of us, but it's very important to note that we've both had multiple great teachers in areas of singing and guitar that at least one or two of which reached a level of kind of mentor on an energetic spiritual level, which I think is so, I don't think you can become a master without a mentor. Yeah, we, yeah, it, it, it's hard, so it's hard to escape past it without talking about that because we, we also were really at war with what the education system was when we were growing up. Because again, there was this, there was this part of me that felt like, oh, I can't be generally good at like 15 things at the same time in school, but I might be really good at this one thing. And so I think w once you find a mentor and you can, you can take your art form and your expression a little bit away from the academic world of criticisms and numbers and ratings and bring it to this place where it's like, if you're not singing well today, what's going on inside of you? What are you actually dealing with? And, and what is this metaphor for the voice that is constricted by something? Because I think that if a person is meant to be a great singer, they're also going to have chapters of their life where they're going to completely lose their voice and need to rediscover and it's going to be a deeper metaphor for who they are. How delicate creative confidence is, it's really interesting. I, like, I've heard this story from so many people. They were nervous to do something creative. They were nervous to sing or nervous to play or something. And they kind of bombed a performance when they were young. I've heard the story so many times. And one teacher kind of said something that like literally permanently kind of scarred their creative confidence and made them feel that they can't do it. There's literal lawful ways to make yourself or another human feel creatively confident. And there's literal lawful ways to make them feel creatively unconfident and completely unsure of themselves. And I think what, what happened faithfully in our education was that, like the metaphor I use as a producer, it's like to have your voice dry and not be confident and not to know that there's a dial that you can push up with your hand and it puts reverb on and then you're like, oh, I like that. Like you don't have your finger on the dial of the mix. And I think it's so cool how our education system teaches every kid every single thing. But the reality is, is that there's innate things that we different humans take to naturally and really love enough to develop into the potential to be a master of. And if you literally mix super loud everything you're bad at and take the thing you're good at and put it beneath it, you will not be confident. Yeah. And if you take the thing you're innately good at and mix it super loud, don't, don't disregard other skills, but mix them a little lower and then you'll be confident. And there's times to be confident and there's times to not be confident, but there's healthy ways of being confident. And there's healthy ways of not being confident. And I've just heard this story way too many times. And as Josh was saying, we had very deep instincts against the way our education, like public education and all the different schools were kind of what they were doing to kids and what they almost did to us in terms of making us feel unconfident, just because we're mixing everything evenly. And it's like, oh, you're really good at music, but that's not as important as all these other things you're bad at. And it's like, it's crazy. It's just crazy how we have to be conscious of when students should be made to feel incredibly confident and when we go into the shadows of our unconfidences and not just like permanently scar mm. kids just because they choked when they sang a note in front of their friends, which is literally the most like nerve wracking way to perform ever in a room of social friends your age. Even when Josh and I do, do a Brothers Page show and with all the friends there, it's the hardest, most difficult thing. And if our voice cracks, we know to laugh and not be traumatized by it because <laughs> that's our armor, yeah. Every singer spends like 15 years thinking about that voice crack. And in thinking about it, they're <laughs> creating it, you know, they're, they're, they're building it in the future and it's gonna happen in this moment. That's just gonna, you know. Whenever you mess up as a performer, by the way, I have this theory where when a bunch of people are focusing energy on you, you are literally in an altered state of consciousness where you are hypersensitive Time slows down dramatically. A little mistake actually feels to your heart like a very, very serious problem. But it actually, the people in the room didn't even really hear it. So when you feel this dramatic instinct of, oh my God, I made a mistake, and you begin to panic, the energy of the room follows you. And if you are able to <laughs> belittle that mistake real quick with a little laugh and keep moving, it literally, that can enlighten the audience 
on an unconscious energetic level. Sometimes I'll do a show and adrenaline will kick in and it will just be like, wow, you know, an hour and a half felt like three minutes. And, and that's the space that Zach was just talking about. The way that the audience is focusing attention on you shifts and contributes to the energy of what you're creating collectively is also um, what, I'm, what I'm mourning most about what just got removed from the world very suddenly. Um, I love even just being in the crowd I loved and love that feeling of being an audience member as well, you know? You know, connection seems to be a huge value. So why is that important to you? I have a thing where like mouth eats and feeds the stomach and mind eats and feeds the heart on an intuitive level. Like my heart's like starving and a form of connection that's pure and respectful and creative, honestly, I've found is what feeds my heart the most. I, I used to feel um, like, like when I would be on the subway, there a part of me would be really excited and comfortable by, by being surrounded by so many different people in that environment and being in the audience. Like that moment, that, that's when I was able to connect with the collective a little bit more and now we're, you know, it, we're not even supposed to walk near each other on the street. So it, it kind of really does bring to, to surface our relationship with connection and, and how we can feel that connection in a safe way when we're going through turbulent times like this. But yeah. Also, also in terms of connection, everyone's taste is forming. So I almost feel like when we share, like if I share a pure guitar thing on social media, it's almost like I just need that to be out in the palette of what people can taste so they'd have a reference for what something pure and peaceful feels like because they'll never say i'm hungry for something pure and peaceful unless they ate it before mm. it's like when you're having anxiety you need to hear what peace feels like before you even know you have the potential to yeah. feel it you need it you need a tonal reference so exactly. that you know what what note is home that you can come back to um and then ironically, we're living in this moment where we have never had the potential to be more connected, but we've never felt more alone. Mm. And, that, and that's just the ultimate paradox of, of technology and humans. I think there's a cool parallel between how you might think the whole entire world being interconnected through social media cures loneliness, but then it doesn't in this fascinating way. It's the same as all these stories of how being rich doesn't make you happy but none of us really believe that they say oh no no no! if i was though i would be happy <laughs> so it's like that's just your thing being able to talk with everyone immediately it doesn't make you feel not lonely the most, com the most complicated <laughs> answer to to, Sorry, a, yeah, to yeah. a simple <laughs> <laughs> so we all have voices in our heads right our inner critic in coaching we call them gremlins i'm sure you're familiar with them they love to show up and tell us what they think we need. Performers are way more familiar with them than they'd like to be. <laughs> and as a performer, I remember when I first started doing concert performances, um, you know, like the biggest moment of my life was I went to this Josh Groban concert. It, you know, I got called up on stage and, and it was, it was, it was like a, a, a nuclear moment that rippled out into, um, you know, even even a decade later, good things still come from moments like that when they start flying. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, was it real? Was it fake and stuff? And to me, it was like, that was the best moment because I didn't have any chance to psych myself out for a week. I didn't know it was coming. So I didn't have time for even a gremlin to mm. to talk down inside myself. That's crazy fake. And then when I started doing concert performances, if I knew that a concert was coming up in a month, I would beat myself up for a month and be pretty scared. I got through maybe maybe half a year of these performances of doing well. And then I realized that before I was walking out on stage, I was repeating over and over in my head, like, am I going to remember the words? Am I going to hit the note? Am I going to do that? Am I going to do this? And then regardless of how the performance would go, when I was leaving the stage, I was saying, did I hit the note? Did I do uh, It's the same thoughts that are repeating before that you have afterwards. When I tried an experiment where instead of saying, am I going to hit the note? Do I remember the words? Oh my God, uh, you know, is my voice feeling dry right now? All of these things that happen 20 seconds before you're walking out. 
because that's when you're most vulnerable is in that 30 seconds, right when you hear that song start and you're about to walk. That's when the gremlins are like, hey, by the way, we've been having a party over here and we just want to have a quick word with you real quick. <laughs> um, and you're like, oh, can I have a second, please? But what I would do is I would repeat over and over to myself, thank you, thank you, thank you, to the point where I didn't even remember a single other word that existed. I was forcing my body and my mind into the gear of thanks. Mm -hmm. And then when I was finished mm -hmm. with the song, those same words were repeating. I looked at the audience and I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. I walked off and th those were the best performances. When I could get my car in the gear of graciousness and out of the gear of self doubt, mm -hmm. it, it became effortless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all really why we're here. It actually leads really well into the question, what is your definition of living in the moment? I think most simply it's, it's when you're feeling more than you're thinking. That might be oversimplifying. What's your in the moment? No, not at all. No, I mean, yeah. my, my in the moment changes every moment that somebody asks me it. <laughs> and I think that's the definition of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it also might be this thing where, you know, the surfer chases that wave for their entire life. And Maybe, maybe it's the futility of humanity to always strive for that moment and to be really, you know, to be, to be in a state of really not finding it sometimes so that we know the difference. I feel like being in the moment is like right now I'm speaking and I'm sustaining what I am. I'm flowing through it, but I'm, my core energy and my heart is channeling into sustaining what I'm doing. So I think when you put your energy outside of yourself and sustain it, I think that's a very effective way to bring yourself into the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. But I think the moment is laughing at us even trying to describe it right now, isn't also, it? Yeah. Also, <laughs> really, I think it really parallels, goes back to connection because I think you can't genuinely be connecting with another human being on the fullest possible level without both being in the moment. Mm. So, I do fear for our, our attention span getting controlled by our focus on social media to a degree where there is a a mental sort of constipation that comes from being very deeply not in the moment i hope that these forms of socials can be used to achieve the opposite result yeah I mean, um even i mean i did i did a lot of work on marketing and social media and i know the secrets of how these algorithms work and unfortunately these platforms reward a negative retention rate. Whereas if you were to see a picture of flowers, it's not going to hold your attention for as long. So none of the companies reward flowers as much as arguments. Yeah. Yep. And I'm worried about the effects of training hundreds of millions of new young human beings to be focused on a negative retention rate through what is trending algorithmically and and i believe it's our job as artists to make flowers super uh attention grabbing somehow <laughs> yeah yeah no if for some reason you couldn't do your music what would life be like for you a lot more of these <laughs> talking probably i don't know <laughs> i think education yeah i want kids to think their teachers are so cool that they're literally speechless in their presence yeah I, I want teachers to become revered by their students as rock stars are revered by their fans mm. yeah then they will learn with very open hearts and very open minds and they will literally the lesson will end and they'll be like please more please more i just i would be a part of that wave probably without music somehow but music really really helps so i'm so glad we have it where do you guys see yourself five years from now that's a good question. Uh, I think we will have we will have really begun the journey to hopefully manifesting um, a, as intensely a support network as we have online, but in person. And we had a little bit of a taste of it, and we were about to go on this tour, and it was it was incredibly gratifying in a way that we had been very disconnected from for many years. So to me, like the next great relationship of my life, I want to be um, with our audience and I want it to be in person and I want us to be able to finally share everything that has been 
um, channeled through us in a live experience where we can see their faces in person. We need those audiences in front of us. And I think that's what we've been um, hungering for. And I hope that that is where we're, we are in five years. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, so like the immediate goal and five year goal is to manifest the deeper spirit that is the real thing Josh and I felt that made us commit to each other as lifelong work partners in addition to brothers to really tangibly manifest that. And the truth is it's that spirit, the way Josh and I sing together when we're actually just singing because we want to sing is in a very like haunting, healing, quiet, beautiful kind of warm way. And when you're in this formulaic social media thing, you need to go and you do that and you gain new fans from being like that. But holding space in a haunting, healing way is just what I'm deeply feeling the world needs right now, more than being entertained in a captivating way. I'm really excited over the next five years to make very deeply haunting, healing, beautiful music releases. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So it sounds like there's a, a pivot ahead. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. a really kind of conscious, respectful rebellion, I'd say, against our traditional and we, we did have an offer for a record deal, and it's really interesting to um, philosophically imagine the fate of, do you want 10, 100 times as many people hearing your music for the next eight years, but you don't own it and have full control over it? Or do you want one-tenth as many people to hear, have to be patient, but you can own everything and have full control? When, when the universe presents you with that, I was just blown away by philosophically how fascinating that choice is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I eventually want to transmute it into education by saying to our fans when they ha like teach them how we had to make a really energetically captivating handshake in order to even meet them and be able to sit with them in a quiet space where we could not have to hold their energy with, with kind of advertising techniques. So it, it's really, but you're totally right. There's a level of complexity and certain shadows that will be uncovered and, and kind of transform as we keep going along this journey. Yeah, I think we know how to create waves. We just need to manufacture one that we'd like to stay on for a long time and not be a shorter attention span kind of mission. And we have to um, detach from- Because being an artist is, yeah. like, is like being a, a surfer, except you are manufacturing your own tsunami throughout your life. And you're trying to like really get in time with riding it correctly when the moment comes. There's this, I have this cool philosophy where it's like, if a million people eat a hot dog, nothing really happens, but the hot dog company makes a million dollars, whatever. But if like one, per, like one, two, three people eat like a certain kind of mushroom or a certain kind of food, the actual exponential effects of the energy of that, of the two people is much greater than 10 billion people eating a hot dog. So it's almost like it's like I consider teaching like that. Like whenever I, I started teaching guitar on Instagram in live streams and it's like they get far less views and far less comments. But the comments and view, the comments I read are kids like it's like a handful of kids who are deeply, genuinely grew on the guitar from watching the video. And giving that to six kids is equivalent to like like deeply affecting and teaching six children is like almost equivalent to subtly energetically uplifting like 200,000 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. What are the top three things that happened so far today? I made a delicious cappuccino this morning. I mean, I took a delightful shower and I hatched a shiny Cleffa in Pokemon Go. <laughs> and considering that we haven't left the house today and you know. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a lot to happen if, you, if you've just been in an apartment, so. Absolutely. <laughs> I am um, drinking a big glass of water when I wake up. It's just like, I'm going to glorify that a little, even though it's a very casual thing. <laughs> and then honestly, it's really cool. Josh and I kind of connect the moment, like close after the moment I wake up. So just feeling a kind of like positive brotherhood camaraderie of momentum starting my day is really nice and cool. And I posted a cool or a really soothing, peaceful, guitar clip on Instagram and some people were tuning into it and saying it was helping with their anxiety and stuff. So that, that was my third. That was oh, that's, that's beautiful. And th this, this honestly takes the cake as number one. Yeah, this is number yeah. one. <laughs> this has been really amazing. We'll place all our number ones. <laughs> oh no, you guys too. I, so I'm going to ask you, I'm dying to ask you this. So you guys are obviously very harmonious, have an incredible relationship. 
But we're all human, right? There must be some times when things aren't quite so smooth. Do you guys ever fight? We used, to, we used to fight like really epically. We were like into Mortal Kombat when we were younger. And we used to actually get really heated, heated anger fighting, but that sure. stopped by the time I was like 10 or 11. But in recent times, our, it's just an over fluctuation of each of our strengths going too far in the wrong direction. So even though I know he's working on an amazing song, if I see that he's not been in his body and that he's floated up to the degree where he's ignoring responsibilities and, and things that you need to um, acknowledge every day, then sometimes it brings out an anger in me that pulls him back down into his body. I think bad. that's the yeah. biggest potential shadow for Z. And if you, you can express my, my no, worst because I expressed I, your worst. No, I have like a <laughs> crazy relationship with anger where I, I haven't gotten overwhelmed by it in a really, really long time. And it's kind of because even like, like when Josh is maybe pulling me down in a way that might like kill my vibe. I, I try to do it with humor also because like, oh my God, you would not believe <laughs> what I have had to do this morning. It's crazy. <laughs> Somebody came into the kitchen last night and I'll make it about somebody else in a way that's, that you can laugh at. Um, and then the kitchen is clean the next day. And I, I know he's, in terms of like when he's tuning me up, I know he's just helping me find balance. So even if it kills my vibe and I'm like, if I get annoyed by it, I ultimately, I can't be angry at him for that. Cause like, and for me, I have a weird relationship with Josh's imperfections. Cause as the producer of our music, anytime I sense any of his imperfections, I'm just trying to protect him from them and and mix them lower than his strengths which is like a producer thing obviously we could just address the imperfection and go into it in a more like personal emotional way but my gut instinct anytime i sense an imbalance from josh that might anger me i just want to protect him from it and the spirit of our music our, what we don't like about each other is pretty fairly well balanced out <laughs> and and uh, yeah even that's balanced it's because we're so unified spiritually in a core intention in a way that's even like beyond family. It's amazing we're faithfully brothers and stuff, but just because we, there's like, there's a deeper core spiritual taste, like consensus between Josh and I than any other soul on the and planet that I've felt. And we'll feel complete and then Kylie will come in. And, Kylie's insane and, too. And, and, and we'll She's collaborate really on awesome. music together and She's then we'll insane. go, oh wow, like that's actually what we were missing the whole time. Um, so that's its own, it's also own the next five years. Sure. She's really deeply the next brothers page single. I'll just say it, it's a Bob Dylan cover of times they are changing mm. and uh, Kylie's doing it with us. And it's the first brothers page release on all streaming that she'll be a part of. And over the next five years, I really, I want to make her like a pretty much like a formal member of the band almost. And there's something, something, there's an unconscious message of three siblings singing in harmony and obviously there's other sibling groups and stuff but i think josh and kylie and i have something really energetically special and unique yes all right are you guys ready for the rapid fire questions who wants to go first i'll start okay you'll start great all right zach let's do the whole thing you ready okay, okay. what makes you sad conditional love mad conditional love frustrated conscious imbalance that won't become balanced interested Beautiful, like cute, alluringness. <laughs> Motivated. Bringing into the world what it's missing. Inspired. Basically. Seeing the, the archetype of what I want to be in other brilliant forms throughout, throughout history. And grateful. There's so many things, but brotherhood just like came to mind first. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> it's hard to be the second one when you know you're going to be asked the same questions. It's like, I and I just did pretty good, so it's a lot to follow up. Yeah, yeah you did great. <laughs> you nailed it. So, so here we go. Are you ready? All right, Josh. What makes you sad? The end of the notebook. Mm. What makes you mad? When people say that they want to collaborate, when they really want to dominate. Frustrated. Frustrated uh, expectations to learn things that innately won't click. Interested. Something that is present in the world that I didn't realize was already interconnected with something that I've already been so fascinated in. Yeah, motivated. The intent to continue to grow and share so that we can build a stronger highway 
to uh, supply the world with love. Inspired. My best potential that I, who I haven't become yet. Grateful. Family. Beautiful. Yeah. That was uh, super good. That was amazing. That was, that was amazing. the scariest moment of my day. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. That was really cool. Rapid <laughs> questions was cool. Yeah. Hey, Josh and Zach, I'm truly grateful for the opportunity to spend, to spend this time together with you. Really, it's been absolutely amazing. I've been speaking today with Josh and Zach, the Brothers Page. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. And remember to live in the moment and check out the show notes because I did not read these guys' bios. But you know what? It's not about the bio. We are human beings, not human doings. And I think Zach's going to play us out. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. This was incredibly beautiful and fun. Sending love out there to everybody listening. Stop time. Lisa, hang with Brothers Page. The city was alive with festivity. The good folk in merry anticipation of the Yuletide festivities, there was an air of cheerfulness that just could not be denied. Yes, that was unbelievable. That's what they Stop time is that beautiful moment where the band is suspended in rhythmic unison, supporting the soloist to express their individuality. In the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create your own rhythm. Until next time, I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening.